Good morning. Good morning, students. Well, it's a pleasure again to teach you even this semester, and the subject is going to be airlines, operations, and management. So welcome to the first session, or rather the first class of airlines, operation, and management. The subject is quite interesting, and you're going to learn about how the airline industry evolved over the years and um, like how the airline industry is managed. Um, we are going to learn also about privatization, um, like what is the state of affairs of the aviation industry and uh, what, you know how some of the airlines are privatized and what are the modes of privatization and so on. So let us begin with the first chapter that talks about the history of aviation. So before I forget and move to the first chapter, um, I'd like to um, let you know that um, there would be eight chapters that you would be covering, eight to nine chapters that you would be covering. And in today's class, we'll be covering chapter one. And if time permits, even chapter two. So now let us mourn chapter one. So chapter one deals with the, the story and the structure of the airline industry. And in this chapter, again, reiterating, we are going to learn about how the airline industry evolved over the years and the history of airlines or you know before we go towards the management of the operations part first let us see how the airline industry evolved over the years now the evolution of the story of airlines industry so as we all know that air transport is one of the major means of transportation today an airline is a company that provides air transport services with the help of aircraft for rendering the service of transporting passengers and of course even freight it's even cargo so of course so the you know the airlines you know they operate their flights not just for the purpose of transporting passengers and freight but now when we're learning about airlines management later on in the other chapters, we are going to see how these airlines, how are they operating, how they are managed, what are the different people who are involved in the aviation industry, and what are the regulations involved, and how, what is the patterns that are, you know, the regulatory patterns that, uh, that are available in an aviation industry, and so on. But to set the perspective, we are going to first study the history where it says that the aviation industry began to develop after the First World War in 1918, evolving since then and predominantly gained momentum only after the Second World War in 1945. And then began the rapid expansion of international routes when after the Second World War. The earliest airlines were introduced in Europe. The first airline was a German airship company, Delag, which was founded on 16th November 1909. However, the world's first scheduled passenger airline service took off in the USA on the 1st of January 1914 from St. Petersburg, Florida to Tampa, that is Florida, about 17 miles, 27 kilometers away. This actually paved the way for today's daily transcontinental flights. One of the earliest airline organization is a British group called the Air Transport Travel Limited. Now, what happened in 1919 was that Netherlands organized a new airline called KLM. Now, this KLM began its service between London and Amsterdam connecting London and Amsterdam, where they use an aircraft which was built by a person called Anthony Forker. So KLM is actually the world's oldest continuously operating airline. Today, towards the 
end later on. Today, in fact, uh, you know, KLM is still a prominent name and people from the aviation sector do know about KLM and especially students of aviation management or even airlines management. I mean, one cannot really avoid learning about KLM or at least, you know, knowing who KLM really was because this was the world's oldest continuously operating airlines. And then back then it was a big name. Now, later on towards the end of the 19th century, European laboratories set the leap in theoretical aeronautical research. There was this NACA, National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, which was established in 1915 and evolved as one of the world's leading aeronautical centers. There was a need, in fact, felt for such a creation of specialized organizations such as the NACA to investigate accidents study the cause and provide recommendations to lay a precedent that would play a key role in the safety of air travel. So this particular body, NACA, was actually established to investigate accidents, prepare reports. And these reports, you know, played uh, a key role in the safety of air travel. How? because these reports would really find out the cause of the accident, as well as they would provide certain recommendations. They would draw an inference on the accident and then based on the conclusion of the inference, they would provide recommendation on what has to be done further to avoid particular mishap that, you know, or type of mishap that took place in a particular accident. And they would provide recommendations. They would improve on that. They would research on that and they would develop on that. So this actually, you know, really uh, worked as a precedent. You know, it worked as a precedent and, you know, based on their reports, further they developed plans and strategies on how to, you know, avoid accidents and how to make air travel more safer. Later on in 1960s, you know, there was a development of jet liners with the introduction of the turbofan engine and the introduction of this wide bodied 400 seat Boeing 747 in 1969. The first international convention in aviation was a Paris Convention of 1919. Well, this is quite a prominent convention, Paris Convention of 1919. Which, as to just for your information, it led also to the development of WIPO, that is, you know, World Intellectual Property Organization. That was kind, of, it, uh, you know, you know, Paris Convention was a kind of, um, you know, a precursor even for the establishment of the World Intellectual uh, Property Organization. Coming back to the concept of aviation, of course. Now, the first international convention that really, uh, you know, um, you know, devised norms and you know, really covered the aspect of aviation was the Paris Convention of 1990, which addressed the regulation of air commerce, the sovereignty of airspace, and each nation had absolute sovereignty over their airspace. I mean, they spoke about the demarcation of airspace of each country and that each country, you know, kind of owns a particular airspace and there shouldn't be any trespassing in that airspace. So there's a Paris Convention that laid down certain regulations to that effect. So this convention led to airspace regulation and laid the foundation of aviation laws, both in the domestic and international sphere, to regulate flights using the airspace of any nation. Nations have the right, of course, to either permit or reject entry into the airspace. Now, while a flight moves from one jurisdiction to another, or it flies, you know, over one country, to another, if the routes are like, if they has to cross over some other country, there are certain laws that regulate the permission has to be sought from the nation or from a country uh, to which or whose airspace is being used for by the particular aircraft as it flies over a particular territory or the airspace, in the territory of a particular nation. So they need to you know, take particular permissions and, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, if there are no permissions, 
and if there are no valid, uh, you know, permits that is taken by, uh, you know, a, a particular airline operating one particular flight over a particular nation in case they fly over the airspace, then that would amount to, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, um, what they say, trespassing the airspace that would amount to the, uh, you know, the offense of trespassing the airspace. And uh, of course, that would attract different aviation laws. So then talking about the Paris Convention, there were 11 countries that participated and ratified this convention, except for countries like USA. Then, of course, a decade later, in 1929, there was a convention for the unification of certain rules relating to international transportation by air, also referred to the Warsaw Convention. Now, this Warsaw Com Convention, there, you know, it laid down covenants on regulating the liability of international carriage of persons, luggage or goods carried by aircraft. The convention was originally signed in 1929 in Warsaw, and it was amended in 1955 at the Hague, uh, you know, and the 1975 convention in Montreal. The chief resolve of the convention was to achieve uniformity of rules governing claims arising from international air transportation. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to Article 17 of the Warsaw Convention, and this is something very important and has to be in your answer books when you're, you know, answering a question on this particular topic. So Article 17 of the Warsaw Convention states that the carrier shall be liable for damage sustained in the event of the death or wounding of a passenger or any other bodily injury suffered by a passenger if the accident which caused the damage so sustained took place on board the aircraft or in the course of any of the operations of embarking or disembarking. So who would be held liable in case of a damage? That would be, of course, the carrier, the airlines or the carrier. The, the carrier will be held responsible or liable for any damage in case of any death or wounding of any passenger while they're on board. If at all the accident, you know, which caused the damage took place on board the aircraft while the passenger was on board the aircraft or in the course of any of the operations of either, you know, embarking of it or even disembarking. So who would be responsible for the particular injury or the damage would be, of course, the carrier. Before 1966, you know, smoking was permitted in flight. We all know that today smoking is not permitted, permitted in flight. But before 1966, it was only after 1966 that, you know, uh, the aircraft were divided into smoking and non-smoking, uh, you know, area. However, in 1996, the International Civil Aviation, the ICA, they sought an out outright ban on smoking. Uh, before that, especially in 1966, you know, smoking was permitted in flight. It was a very interesting case of Olympic Airways versus Hussein. So here what happened was, there was a person called Dr. Abid Hansen, who was a passenger on Olympic Airways Flight 417 from Cairo, Egypt, via Athens, Greece, to New York City in the US. Now, Dr. Hansen, he died following exposure to secondhand smoke. Now, Dr. Hansen, who had a history of recurrent anaphylactic reactions and sensitivity to secondhand smoke, his wife insisted and requested a non-smoking seat. He was not a smoker, of course, but there was someone else who was smoking. So they said that, well, we do not want a particular seat because this, this doctor was directly getting affected by the smoke that was emanating from, of course, you know, you know, from the cigarette of one of the smokers was there in a particular area of that particular aircraft. So his wife, of course, objected to that and said that, well, can you just, you know, transfer us to a non-smoking seat? So when the family boarded the Boeing 747 aircraft in Athens, the family found that the assigned seats were three rows ahead of economy class smoking area, and there was no partition between the smoking and non-smoking sections in this Olympic Airways flight. 
The family repeatedly requested a seat farther away from the smoking section, but the flight attendant, Maria Leptrogo, would not move the passenger to any of the 11 other unoccupied seats on the aircraft. So Dr. Hansen felt a reaction to the smoke and died several hours later, despite his doctor's aid. So the question before the court was whether a pre-existing medical condition aggravated by airplane conditions can be considered an accident under the Warsaw Convention, Article 17, holding the airline responsible for the damages? That was a question. So a three-judge bench of the U.S. Court of Appeals unanimously affirmed that Maria Leptrogo's actions not only met the definition of accident under Article 17 of the Warsaw Convention, but also rose to the level of being willful misconduct under Article 25 of the same convention, that is the Warsaw Convention, by passing that threshold, it, it you know, it, uh, it really imposed dollar 75,000 cap on the damage. So the Supreme Court, Court affirmed the Court of Appeals award of US 700,000 in compensatory damages against Olympic Airways and held that the conduct here constitutes an accident under Article 17 of the Warsaw Convention. That means the airlines had to be held responsible because it was the airline staff, the employee of that particular airlines who, you know, did not heed to the request of the passenger, even though they requested and you know, explained to them, uh, explained to her about the health condition of Dr. Hansen, but she did not pay heed and did not help the passenger and move the passenger to any other seat. So therefore, the airline was vicariously liable for the misconduct of its employee, Maria Leptrigo. Now, as for the Warsaw Convention, airlines are liable to pay damages caused to the passengers in terms of death or bodily injury during embarking, disembarking, or even onboard carriage. So the carrier may escape liability. Now, what could be the defense? It, the carrier can you know, cling to the defense or escape liability if all reasonable precautions have been taken to avoid the injury or the plight of a passenger. Now, protection for not only the person, but also for goods or luggage of the passengers is assured by the regulation. There is yet another interesting case of Eastern Airlines Incorporation versus Floyd. Now, here what happened was there was a flight which is directed by Eastern Airlines from Miami to Bahamas experienced, you know, this particular flight experienced engine failure. The in-flight aircraft team let the passengers know that the plane would need to land in the sea. After a time of quick drop, the team had the option to recover control of the plane and land it securely. So the passengers were not really harmed. Floyd and the other passengers sued Eastern for mental misery under Article 17 of the Warsaw Convention. But the court held that Article 17 of Warsaw Convention does not allow recovery for merely mental injuries because ultimately the plane landed securely. Now let's move on to study the structure of airline industry. Now, traditionally, airlines are owned by public sector. As I said during the beginning of the class, I spoke about these days, airlines being privatized. So traditionally, airlines are owned by the public sector in any country, but today, most airlines have transitioned towards privatization. There are basically five types of privatization models. One is shared flotation, two is straight sale, three concession, four project finance, or it's also called as BOT, that is build, operate, transfer. And the fifth one is management contract. So these are some of the modes how privatization takes place. Or, you know, these are the five models of privatization. And let's move on to see each of these modes. Now, in 2012, the ICAO, that is International Civil Aviation Organization, published a manual on privatization for the first time to help with the privatization decisions and processes. So 
privatization therefore involves a complex decision making process and, and it's not an easy one it involves a series of complex decisions that need to be taken with a structured goal to be achieved such a goal or goals may be in terms of reducing the financial burden of the public sector or share ownership building efficiency maintaining healthy comp comp competition generating funds increasing management expertise you know or building a better structure industrial growth and so on and some of the reasons that may be considered as a goal of privatization these are also some of the you know uh, the reasons that can be considered as you know some of the goals of privatization of airlines now, factors such as the extent of control that the government wishes to maintain in terms of partial privatization, PPP, that is the public-private partnership, will also have to be gauged or studied and observed. Now, let us now delve into each model of privatization in brief. The first one being share flotation. What is share flotation? It simply implies an initial public offering that is IPO there in the airport's uh, you know, the airport companies share capital is issued and subsequently traded on the stock market. The first priority will be given to the current management of the company to acquire shares. The government owner, on the other hand, will give up total or partial ownership and transfer the existing economic risks and operative control to the new shareholders. The next is trade sales. Under this option, though the vehicle of public tender, some portion of, you know, through the vehicle of public tender, some portion of the airport or at times even the entire airport may be sold to a trade partner or a consortium of investors. And the highest bidder here of the tender would be the one who would be able to bring in the highest investment into the business. Example, there's this Brussels airport, which is, you know, partially privatized through this mode of privatization that is trade sale. The consortium in this model normally comprises airport management specialists, domestic and foreign banks, and engineering firms, <clears throat> excuse me, whose combined ex expertise attracts private capital. So what is better? IPO, share flotation, or trade sales? That is, what is better? Share flotation or trade sales? Well, that depends upon how well the airport or even the airlines are performing and the rationale or the reasoning behind the decision of privatization. However, generally speaking, by and large, trade sales seems to be a better option, you know, for the, the sales in the stock market. Why? Because the trade sale new management comes in with trade sale. There is a new management that comes in and they take over, you know, and along with that, of course, there will be a huge investment that is, you know, poured in. So confidence in the performance of airport are stimulated to the next level. So how does this happen? In a straight sale, of course, the buying party undertakes the detailed due diligence of the airport and studies the risks associated with the purchase. Financial and operational structure can be changed with a trade sale, which may not be always possible with an IPO. Moreover, you know, moreover in an IPO, I'm sorry, Moreover, in an IPO, the operations of the company are more reliant on the current or existing management whose performance may be more or less, and uh, you know, more or less, you know, what, what can be expected, you know, it depends. So the operations of the company are more reliant on the current or existing management. And what about concessions? Under this model through tendering process, the privatized airport will be taken on the agreement of lease or purchase, a concession for a definite period of 30 or 50 years by a consortium or airport management company. Now, the striking feature of concession on this model uh, or concession agreement is the allocation of risk between the airport operator and the government. So the risk here is distributed between the airport operator and the government here. So the risks associated with operating and financing the airport and traffic would be handed over to the airport operator. For example, here in, is the agreement between GBK and others on one hand and Mumbai Airport on the other. This is the best example that I could really think of. Now, under this arrangement, the privatized airport is handed over only for a fixed period, thereby the government owner has a greater degree of control than it would have under an outright sales. So the 
what is the benefit here? The benefit here is in terms of either the regular annual revenue stream or the upfront payment that is received or both. So, you know, that was the benefit that they would, you know, really anticipate of deriving either it could be a regular annual revenue stream or an upfront payment that is received or probably given both. The next one is project finance of bot. And, um, you know, under this arrangement, a redevelopment company will usually either redevelop or even build a terminal and then operate it for a definite period as the case may be, or as it may be contracted for a particular period, which may be for, you know, maybe two or even three decades, it's a longer duration. Now, such a company may be a PPP, that is public-private partnerships, or maybe sometimes even totally private. After the period, the control will revert to the government. For example, here is a 25-year uh, bot project to develop a new terminal for Queen Alia's International Airport in Amman in Jordan in the year 2007. Uh, yet another example could be the Athens Airport, which was built under a 30-year bot arrangement. Now, this Greek government, of, of course, Athens Airport, holds 55% of the shares in the company. That is Athens International Airport, SAAIA, and the remaining share of 45% belongs to an international consortium that is led by Emma Alliance. The fifth model of privatization is management contract. For this, again, the example would be the, uh, you know, India's Bangalore Airport, which is operating under this arrangement as a form of consortium with GMR Malaysia for 30 years beginning in the year 2004. So under a management contract that may be for a duration of 10 years or more, the ownership under this model remains with the government and the contractor just takes the responsibility for the operations. So the annual management fee is paid by the government to the contractor and under this agreement for the operational performance of the airport or the contractor may pay the government a share of its revenue. So, well, the economic risks may be some, you know, shared by both the parties. And it depends also how clearly this particular clause of sharing economic risks is adumbrated in the contract. Well, now let's move on to chapter two, the fundamentals of airline management. If you have any questions, you can always ask me. But before that, um, probably you can take a break. And we'll come back in three minutes. So we are going to learn about the fundamentals of airlines management.